All right, thank you. So we're back and, and Jen, thanks for, for being here with us. We have S24 on the schedule to get a first look. Um, and why don't you walk us through the bill? It's the, the flavored uh, products bill that we passed last year out of committee and then it went, um, it went to finance and then it sort of ended there uh, with COVID and the committee never really had an opportunity to fully um, present the bill to the Senate. So we'll look at it again. Okay, hey, do you want me to put the language up on the screen? Yes, please. Okay, great. Uh, so for the record, Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council, uh, and I will put this up. All right, can you now see my screen? Great. So this is S24, as um, the chair said, this was a bill that was uh, worked on in this committee last year. It was S288 from the prior biennium. Um, and the bill as introduced is as it left this committee last year. So this committee had made some changes and those are reflected in here. It's not the same as what was introduced last year. So it starts out with uh, a number of findings, and I don't know if you want me to go through those or just note that they're here for another time. Um, uh, why, don't, why don't we skip them for now or, and then we'll come back to them. Uh, they, are, they are pretty important um, as an introduction, but let's skip them for now. Okay. Um, so section two then amends the chapter on tobacco products. Um, it makes some changes in definitions it, uh, it tries to make some, create some consistency between definitions in the tobacco taxes chapter in Title 32 and in, um, in this chapter. So that's this definition that you're seeing under tobacco products. Tobacco substitute, uh, it expands the definition of tobacco substitute to capture some emerging products. Um, so it talks about, for example, about components, parts, and accessories of electronic or battery powered devices. Um, also talks about inhalation or other absorption of aerosol, vapor, or other emission. And these are all, when we talk about tobacco substitute, it's, it's the statutory term we use for what people often call electronic cigarettes um, or vaping devices, things like that. These are things that have not been approved by the FDA for tobacco cessation or other medical purposes. So if it's a tobacco cessation device, it's not a tobacco substitute under our definition. And then it adds a definition of e-liquid. This is the substance, solution substance or other material used in or with a tobacco substitute that is heated or otherwise acted upon to produce an aerosol, vapor, or other emission to be inhaled or otherwise absorbed by the user, regardless of whether it contains nicotine. So this is a new definition, but, but a term we've been kind of describing in various ways. So one of the things this bill is doing is creating some consistency around the use of this term. Um, it adds this e-liquid terminology throughout the statute. So you'll see in this next section about getting a license, it specifically requires someone to have a, a tobacco license from the Division of Liquor Control um, in order to engage in the retail sale of e-liquids as is required already for these other items. So a lot of this, a lot of the changes are just adding e-liquids to the various existing provisions, or in this case, um, replacing substances containing nicotine or otherwise intended for use with a tobacco substitute with our new term e-liquids. A little bit cleaner and easier to use. So again, same changes in this section. It's really amending the whole, uh, whole chapter on tobacco products, creating some consistency in various places. So for example, a dis the display of tobacco products, this would also add tobacco substitutes and e-liquids. Um, this is an exemption for what has to be, um, where things can be displayed. Uh, if it's in a in an establishment where no one under 21 is permitted to enter. Again, adding e-liquids. Um, then this piece here in section um, 1005 eliminates the ban on and penalty for possession 
of cigarettes, e-cigarettes, and tobacco paraphernalia by people who are under 21 years of age. So it keeps the ban on, on uh, and penalty for purchasing, attempting to purchase, and using false identification to purchase or attempt to purchase these products for e-liquids. Um, but it gets rid of the, the ban and penalty for possession. That's that piece that we have again, adding e-liquids. Then somewhere in here we get to, this is the sort of correction of the name, this, this um, tobacco evaluation and review board became part of one, one board that was folded into the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council. Um, added some provisions to the contraband and seizure statute um, to reflect the various items that are not allowed to be sold, offered, or in some cases possessed. Um, so this is adding it to adding the tobacco substitutes, e-liquids, and tobacco paraphernalia, and the appropriate cross-references for those. Then again, changing a definition or changing a term to use this shorter e-liquids term that we have defined in full um, and adding tobacco substitutes, e-liquids and, and tobacco paraphernalia to um, part of the, um, to the description of, of, of what somebody would be uh, assessed a, viola a penalty for, for violating if they made a shipment in violation of the law. Um, again, here using the term e-liquids uh, e containing nicotine instead of liquid nicotine. And then finally we get to section, a new section here, section 7 BSA 1013. Um, and this is flavored tobacco products, flavored tobacco substitutes and flavored e-liquids prohibited. We start out with a definition here of characterizing flavor. It means a taste or aroma other than that of tobacco imparted either prior to or during consumption of a tobacco product or tobacco substitute or component part or byproduct of a tobacco product or tobacco substitute. It includes tastes or aromas relating to any fruit, chocolate, vanilla, honey, maple, candy, cocoa, dessert, alcoholic beverage, mint, menthol, wintergreen, herb, or spice, or other food or drink, or to any conceptual flavor that imparts a taste or aroma that is distinguishable from tobacco flavor, but may not relate to any particular known flavor. I'll just pause here for a moment. A lot of the, the terms in this section um, came from some rules and emergency rules that were adopted in other jurisdictions um, a couple of years ago when there was a lot of concern about, in particular, youth using flavored vaping products. Um, and so this was largely a list of their tastes or aromas, although I added maple because we're Vermont and it seemed wrong to have a list of flavors that did not include maple. Um, and this idea of a conceptual flavor, you'll hear about things like um, unicorn puke and, uh, and things like that that are not any actual um, known flavor, but are, uh, based on the descriptions, not tobacco flavored either. So a um, little background there. Sandra Lyons. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, in all of that description, last year, this thing fell on its sword on menthol. Does this ban menthol cigarettes? Yes, it does. Okay. That's why it didn't come off the wall in finance last year. That was the Senator, that, that, that will be uh, a, a significant part of our consideration and yeah. testimony. Yeah, so one of the characterizing flavors here is menthol. Um, and then we get to flavored e liquid. Is any e liquid with a characterizing flavor? It is presumed to be flavored if uh, a licensee, manufacturer, or their agent or employee has made a statement or claim directed to consumers or the public, whether expressed or implied, that the product has a distinguishable taste or aroma other than that of tobacco. Flavored tobacco product means any tobacco product with a characterizing flavor. Um, again, it's presumed to be flavored if there is any uh, statement or claim expressed or implied that it has a distinguishable taste or aroma other than that of tobacco. 
So all of these items are pulling in this characterizing flavor definition, which includes menthol. Uh, and then flavored tobacco substitute, again, any tobacco substitute with a characterizing flavor and that same language about uh, the presumption for flavors. And then a tobacco retailer is um, anyone who owns, operates, or manages the retail establishment with a tobacco license from the Division of Liquor Control. So then this, this ban uh, says no person shall engage in the retail sale of any flavored tobacco product, flavored e-liquid, or flavored tobacco substitute. If a tobacco retailer or their agent or employee violates this section, the retailer, so not the employee or agent, but the retailer is subject to a civil penalty of not more than $100 for a first offense and not more than $500 for a second offense. This is for the same as would it be for uh, as same as the existing penalties for sales to a minor. And an action under this section will be brought in the same manner as for a traffic violation. So that means uh, in the at the Judicial Bureau uh, within 24 hours of the occurrence of the alleged violation. Section three then gives the Judicial Bureau jurisdiction over violations of the ban on the sale of flavored products. Um, it also makes a conforming change uh, to reflect that the possession would not be subject of, by minors is not subject to penalty, but the purchase is. Um, of tobacco products generally. And then section four is a conforming change adding e-liquids to an exception in the default penalty provisions for all of title seven. Section 16, uh, sorry, say, section five is in title 16. It adds uh, e-liquids to a ban on the use of tobacco products and e-cigarettes on public school grounds. Section six makes conforming changes to the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council. Um, so again, using the e-liquids term instead of the longer description. Um, section seven makes some clarifying changes to the definition of other tobacco products for purposes of the tax on e-cigarettes. Um, there were some inconsistencies in that language and then it also pulls in again, this new e-liquids definition and then section eight directs the attorney general's office to report by December to uh, this committee and to the economic development committee and to uh, various committees in the house about whether and to what extent Vermont can legally restrict advertising and regulate the content of labels for electronic cigarettes and other vaping related products in this state. You know, there has been a fair amount of interest in what the state uh, can do and it seemed like a good idea to get you some, some information um, from those who would be in a position to defend the law if you were to enact one. And it would take effect on September 1st, which was the same, uh, September was when you also had the change in the, uh, in the use of tobacco by minors statute, I think uh, to give some time for enforcement to be ready, but also have it up and, and running approximately the time that the kids start back in school for the fall. Um, thank you, Jen. Um, you know, I guess as the lead sponsor on the bill, I would like to say a few words um, of introduction to the bill and why I feel it's important. And you can look at the findings that are there in the bill. And I think the first finding is particularly compelling that we spend, um, Vermont spends over um, $348 million annually to treat tobacco related illnesses. And that's 87.2 million in Medicaid dollars. So that's a lot of money. Um, that's a, the long-term goal for reducing those chronic illnesses is something that we sometimes cannot see because we're, we keep our eyes on the short-term revenue prize. And so we'll have a, uh, we'll have a fiscal note regarding um, this. But, but much more compelling to me is the data that's coming out about the increase of youth utilization for um, cigarettes and particular menthol cigarettes. So if you look at some of the, some of the information, um, you find that uh, 
in 20, uh, in 2017, between 2017 and 2019, there was a 20% increase in the use of menthol cigarettes. Um, that was by over, over 20% by kids. Uh, high school students who smoke use menthol cigarettes. 54.5% of Vermont high school students who smoke use menthol cigarettes. That engages them not just in the use of the cigarette, but in an addiction that may carry on for time over time. 48.4% uh, of middle school students use menthol cigarettes. Those who smoke use menthol cigarettes. So the flavors have become extremely attractive and we're gonna hear testimony ne next week that I think will help us understand the inequity that is out there, not just in the advertising, but then in the result of the use of tobacco and flavored products generally. So we know that African-Americans uh, and LGBTQ are much more likely to use flavored e-cigarettes and tobacco, including menthol. We'll get some data on that. But it, the, the attractive nature of advertising has resulted not just in inequity of use, but now in equity of health. And so we see that some of our minority populations are being greatly affected by um, inhalation, by smoke, by nicotine addiction. Uh, so we'll hear testimony about that. And I find it extremely compelling. The uh, vulnerability to diseases cannot be understated for our um, African-American and Black population, particularly during COVID. And we have seen recent um, articles, and I, I don't know whether I put them on the web page or not, but we'll get some, an article or two out on the effect of um, the relationship between smoking and COVID. So there is a, there is a great deal for us to uh, put our heads into in terms of the significant public health issues related to the use of flavored e-cigarettes and flavored tobacco, including menthol. I know there are some misconceptions about menthol and we'll try to sort those out. I, I call it the menthol mask. Uh, the menthol mask is that it doesn't feel bad when you inhale it, but you're still getting damage to the trachea, the bronchi and the lungs. Uh, so we'll get testimony about whether or not menthol actually causes, uh, helps people to uh, quit. We've heard that, and yet we know that nine in 10 uh, Black adults uh, utilize menthol cigarettes, and that perpetuates in the, that cohort. So there's a lot of data out there, a lot of information, and I think one of the things this bill does for me is it highlights um, some of the public health issues around inequality and about the inequities that we are seeing with our um, our BIPOC and LGBTQ populations. So uh, I will say no more, but I do encourage you to read through the findings. We may find that we want to add, subtract, um, or modify some of those to be, um, to be representative of the current, um, current information as we hear testimony. So Senator Terenzini has very patiently waited with his hand up. Uh, but as sp lead sponsor, I did want to introduce the bill and we'll probably, we will go through the bill again as we hear more from folks who testify uh, so that we can fully understand what, um, what Jen has presented today. So Senator Terenzini. Well, thank you, Senator Lyons. Uh, thanks for the explanation. Gives me a better understanding of uh, the bill as this is my first time looking at it. Uh, just for my clarification, and I believe the question, but um, so menthol cigarettes and then flavored liquids or whatever you put in a, an e-cigarette, would chewing tobacco be a part of this, flavored chewing tobacco? Great question. I don't remember. Let me scroll down and look at the definitions. Yeah. It's another tobacco product. Right. I think, I think it is. I think it is a... Um, I'm just just 
And this is for adults, adults and, and children, children, right? Uh, uh, right. I mean, purchase, purchase, and purchase would be banned for anyone under twenty-one, regardless of whether it's flavored or unflavored. That that's already the case. Um, so the definition of tobacco products um, in our statutes is cigarettes, little cigars, roll your own tobacco, snuff cigars, new smokeless tobacco, which I think is um, chewing tobacco, and any other product manufactured from, derived from, or containing tobacco that is intended for human consumption by smoking, by chewing, or in any other manner. So yes, okay. it would include. Thank you for the uh, clarification, Jennifer. Sure. Other, other questions uh, for Jen on the bill? Uh, Jen, I do have a question. I, I know that there's a, a the purchase, use, and possession, um, the PUP <laughs> provisions. Um, so there was a bill, there's a bill introduced in economic development on that. And I'm, but is none, is that in, as you went through the bill, I, I apologize. I was probably too glazed over my own bill, but how much of the PUP is included in this bill, if any? Uh, a fair amount is, uh, I think. I'd, I'd have to look at them side by side. I don't remember which pieces. There's certainly a lot of the sort of general cleanup provisions are in both, um, but there are some differences. I'd be happy to, to look at that and get back to you. Okay. Yeah, that would be good. I, I want to make sure that we're coordinated with whatever uh, comes out of economic development. Senator Hardy. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch, what is PUP? I didn't catch what that was and coordinating with what? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so it's purchase, use, and possession. So currently there are... Um, on, on the books, Jen, maybe you could explain the, the fines that are on the books, the, the legality of purchase, use, and possession for underaged folks. Right, and I'm just, I'm pulling up the, the other bill so that okay. I can. Um, so one of the things, as we took, have taken testimony in the past and we, uh, actually I think it was Senator Cummings who originally brought up the idea that if, uh, if an underage um, uh, African-American male is driving in his car smoking, there, that could be uh, considered an opportunity by uh, public safety to pull him over. Um, so, under the so under the existing law, um, there's a prohibition on anyone under 21 years of age possessing, purchasing, or attempting to purchase tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, or tobacco paraphernalia, unless they're an employee um, you know, of, a, of a retailer. There's also a specific ban on rep misrepresenting age to purchase or attempt to purchase these products. And then there is a $25 um, civil penalty for someone who possessed, for a minor who possesses these items in violation of this prohibition. And then there's a larger penalty for someone who misrepresents their age by presenting false, uh, false identification. That's um, civil penalty of up to $50 or 10 hours of community service or both. So all of that would be uh, repealed in the bill that is in Senate Economic Development, it's S41. There are also a couple of other provisions in it that, that are related um, that would be modified as well. So the bill S24 that you're looking at would, would similarly eliminate the prohibition on possession by minors, but would uh, keep the penalty for purchase and attempting to purchase. Um, so one of them is, is getting rid of penalties on purchase use and possession, the other, that's S41, the purchase piece still remains against the law in S24, but the 
use and possession. I mean, there isn't really a big distinction in, in there between use and possession. Um, so there isn't, so what, I guess what I'm saying is there isn't a specific, you can possess, but you can't use distinction somewhere, or you can use, but you can't possess. So you think of it as purchase, purchase and possession. Um, that's what the one in economic development gets rid of. Possession is what S24 would get rid of, but it would still penalize purchase. And, and I think that some of the uh, arguments that people had provided for wanting to get rid of the possession penalty uh, had to do with the, the addiction, addictive qualities of um, some of these items and, um, and concern about penalizing an addiction. Go ahead, Senator Cummings. Is that, but first, does that answer your question, Senator Hardy? Yeah, I think so. And this bill, our bill that we're looking at gets rid of the possession stuff too in, in most of the cases. And, and S41, the other bill, does a more comprehensive, it's beyond tobacco or is it just related to tobacco products? So they, right, so they are different. It is just related to tobacco, um, tobacco products. It doesn't get into the, the flavor ban. The flavor ban actually only um, is, for, is a ban on the retail sale. So there are some distinctions between the two of them that get hard to, to right. abstractly generalize. Um, but I can, I can, if it's helpful, I can put something together that compares them or well, you know, whatever, whatever's useful. Moving targets at this point, right? Um, in terms of the committees are both, are, is that bill being actively worked on, um, Senator Lyons? Is, I, I don't know. Don't know? Oh, I don't okay. know at this point. Okay. I, I don't need to know this now. I just, you know, curious moving yeah, forward. No, it, I think it's important for us to understand there's another bill out there that could be in play, but we can focus just on what this bill does at this point. Senator Cummings. Okay. This bill would ban anything other than raw tobacco taste from possession use or from sale or just sale. Just sale. Just so retail sale. Tobacco flavored tobacco in Vermont. And it's not illegal to possess other things. I believe last time we had testimony from a smoke shop owner who literally moved 50 yards over the border and opened a store in New Hampshire and closed his Vermont store because his customers can walk to New Hampshire. You can, so a teenager can go to New Hampshire, buy vapes, come back here, and there's no penalty for smoking them, right? Right. And, okay. and the bill is introduced, that's right. We know what, well, we can't get into Quebec anymore. Do we know what New York does? Not off the top of my head, but I can. That would be worth look. checking. Uh, we know New we, we know Massachusetts has uh, passed this the the bill before us the the full ban. Senator Cummings, I don't know. Is everyone else hearing this strange? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Your, I'm like Darth Vader, your audio is really weird, and it's uh, oh, okay. Uh, I don't have anything else on. I will shut it off. It sounds like there may be a problem with the microphone. Yeah. You sound like a little grizzly bear. Oh. <laughs> well, I haven't changed anything. Well, we can, we can understand what you're saying. It's just that there's a little growl that comes through. <laughs> um, okay. I'll, I haven't changed anything. I'll shut it back off. Well, don't, I mean, uh, do you have anything else to, that you wanted to add or, or uh, ask at this point? No. Nope. All right. Any, any other, any questions about this? So, so Jen, just to clarify one more time for, for those of us who are, 
really have the a need to understand thoroughly. The can you explain to us um, sort of the overarching provisions of the bill? So the bill bans what, allows for the for the purchase of what, for the use of what, for the possession of what. So the, I think those. Those are kind of the bottom line areas for the bill. So the bill bans the retail sale, but not the possession of flavored cigarettes, e-cigarettes, and e-liquids. So only tobacco flavored products would be allowed. This includes a ban on menthol cigarettes. Um, it does not prohibit, as I said, possession uh, of any of these items by anyone, regardless of age, because it eliminates the ban and penalty for possession by minors. And by minors, in this case, the, it is uh, under 21. So retail sale, you could, uh, people 21 and over could only purchase tobacco flavored products at retail sale, um, but possession of anything it would be allowed. Anyone, although, although I should I should clarify that I mean the the retail sale piece also incorporates the um, the ban on internet direct sales. So right, right. Um, so that would be included as well. Right, but if as long as there's a state over the border you can go and purchase and then bring it back and use it. Mm -hmm. Bring it back and, uh, yes, and use it. So Senator Hooker and then Senator Terenzini. So this would also include all of those old time tobacco, um, or pipe tobacco products like cherry tobacco and, and the like, correct? I believe that's accurate based on the definition of um, tobacco products. Senator Terenzini. Thank you. Uh, are there any other states that um, currently outlaw um, these products that we know of? That's a really good question. The answer is yes. And um, it's not really outlaw, it's really just ban, but the outlaw is a, that's an interesting phrase. <laughs> it's, a, it's a synonym, it works. It's a synonym, yeah, it works, okay. So uh, I, know, I know Massachusetts does, and I know there, there I think some other states have since pass that law, but we'll, uh, this is a question that we'll have to ask folks as they come in to testify. And I can so, certainly okay, look so into I'm, it as well. Yeah. I'm not, a, I'm not a cigarette smoker, so I'm, I don't, I don't know, but if I was in Massachusetts and wanted to pick up a pack of smokes and they were menthols, I could, I could not, you're saying essentially. Yes, that's right. Hmm, interesting. And, and you couldn't get any flavors anywhere. Gotcha. Yeah, so, and, you know, I had thought about having someone in from Massachusetts, and we may well do that as time goes on uh, to hear what, what's happened there, um, you know, what effect it's had. Uh, the, um, we, have a, we have a full day of testimony scheduled for next Wednesday, and then after that, we'll, we'll be bringing other folks in uh, to get perspective. You're, Senator Lyons, you're trying to make it so I'm never welcome at a family reunion again. <laughs> no, I no, I'm not. No, I'm not. You you are working for the for the health and welfare of the people of the state. <laughs> that's that's our goal. I mean, the Constitution does provide for the public health and welfare. And this this is a, this I know it's not easy. Any other questions, Senator Hooker? Just a comment that um, Massachusetts was the first state to do this, and then, whoops, New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and California have also banned them. So. I have to look at that. I'm not, I think there may be some nuances or some of it was done by, uh, by regulation. Uh, yep, yeah, some by law. Um, so let me, let me look into it and get back. Yeah, to why don't, why don't you sort that out? And we'll, when we, when we bring you back on this one, um, 
we'll have we'll maybe look at what other states have done a little bit. Would, is that something you can provide, or should we reach out to someone else for that? Uh, I will do my best. I may reach out to um, to some of the advocates, or if they have information and want to provide it to me, that is also great. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Senator. Just um, how is my audio now? I'll You're still a little grizzly bear. Okay, I'll stop the the video. Does that help? No, no. Uh, we it, it's good when we can see you because then we can lip read. All right. Well, maybe I'll just shut down my computer and restart. Um, I I think if we're going to hear from other states, I'd like to know how successful they've been in cutting out or reducing smoking. Because I find it interesting, we just legalized cannabis on the argument that prohibition doesn't work. We are not prohibiting strawberry flavored vodka or Boone's Farm or any of the other youth focused alcohol. And I, I want to know before we do this, does it work? And see if some of those other states can tell us. So I guess that's a that's a that's a point that we may well we want to hear about. But remember something about our alcohol sales in this state; it's highly regulated. The cherry strawberry flavored vodka can only be purchased in certain places, and there's, um, you know, and we've had a lot of very um, a lot of focus on that similarly with cannabis so I'm not sure the analogy is going to be something that helps us but we'll certainly look at it the uh, the amount of money that we put into chronic conditions as a result of tobacco is significant and we want to try to uh, begin to get rid of that you know the 348 million dollars a year is just overwhelming for me but um so good question. And have other states seen any, any decrease in those expenditures? It's probably too short a time really to get results, but I don't know, we'll, we'll find out. Senator Lyons? Yeah. So last year, this bill went through your health care committee and ended up in finance. Is that what I was understanding? Yes, and, and to be quite honest about it, uh, it ended up in finance and the discussion was focused on some um, information about um, menthol tobacco, as far as I know. Uh, but that's, you know, I think the issue and about money, I mean, finance is money. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What was uh, it? It stayed on the wall because there were several straw polls and support with the menthol ban, I believe there were three pro votes. Oh. It didn't have the support, so we didn't bring it out. These okay, were, that uh, helps. All right, so I think, yes, yeah, so, so uh, what I think is that it will be incumbent on whatever this committee decides to ensure that we have a very focused um, uh, argument for whatever we pass out. We never really had the opportunity to share the information that we learned in committee. So, oh, she's going to come back. I know that. All right, Senator Terenzini, go ahead. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, when it was voted out of health and welfare in the last biennium, was it a unanimous vote? Yes, it was. And uh, number two, um, will we hear testimony from say like the Vermont Grocers Association or one of those about their about the impacts to the financials of that industry? Yes, we will. Okay, we'll hear thank from you. Them. And we'll hear from them, we'll hear from the tobacco industry, we'll hear from a, a number of folks. Uh, next week is really focused on the health, health issues and um, the inequity uh, that we see as a result of uh, advertising from the industry. So we'll, we'll but we will, we will look at um, all those, the other areas. I'm back. Is my audio any better? Oh, it's awesome. Yes. Okay. When in doubt, shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I won't say it, but you did sound a little bit like you had been smoking. Okay, no. <laughs> I have never smoked. My father would have disowned me if I looked at a cigarette. <laughs> I know. Isn't that amazing, huh? Times, times have changed. All right. Um, any other questions for Jen on uh, S24? Uh, and so I'm hearing, I'm hearing some of the interest in who we should hear from. So to the extent practicable, uh, we want to hear about other states and we'll try and get information from those other states, whether it's directly or through some compilation of information available from those states. Um, and then we're also, I do have um, the Vermont Grocers Association on my list. I do have the uh, tobacco industry on my list. And I would like also to hear from some youth who are very engaged in um, the area of youth tobacco prevention. So we'll hear from them. Um, and, and we also have some researchers, uh, advocates, and some national uh, national figures who have been very much involved in the uh, issues around inequity uh, will be coming in. That, I mean, given the focus that we have in this state right now on equitable treatment um, for some of our, for the uh, BIPOC and LGBTQ, this, this, this bill to me really uh, represents an opportunity to uh, look at that issue in health and welfare. Oh. And so let me know if you have other ideas about who you want to hear from. Um, and we'll, we'll try to get everyone scheduled in on uh, a, a, another day. We have one day full. We'll try and get another day full uh, so we can uh, fully understand the bill. And we'll have Nolan put together, um, or Graham Campbell, I guess, a fiscal note so we understand some of the fiscal consequences of what we send out and probably over somewhere if it goes to finance. Senator Hardy. Thank you. I was gonna ask, um, and you already mentioned it, that to have some of the uh, youth groups and who've been working on this issue. So thank you for that. Um, can I ask Jen a question about a slightly different topic? <laughs> If, if we're so, as soon as we get to closure on this one, absolutely. Okay. We'll, we'll All right. That. I just want to reserve my, my question for her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You got it. Um, questions for Jen comments. I we're not really ready for full discussion until we have the data in front of us. Uh, remember our goal here is to look at the health implications of, uh, what we learn about flavors. There's a lot to learn, so we'll go with that. Okay. No other questions, comments? Senator Hardy, you have a question for Jen. Yeah, Jen or Nolan. Um, I see Nolan's on the screen too. Um, I'm wondering if either of you have the link to the audio only report that, that that keeps, I, I, the reason I'm asking, I read it at one point, but I cannot find the link. I just asked Nellie and Nellie wasn't able to find the link either. Yes. Um, so if you could I will send that, that to maybe you. Yep. to the whole committee, I just like to review it again before we talk about that issue again. Sure. And it should also be available if you go back into the documents and look under, I think my name, um, yeah. Katie and I had presented that list of all the reports that are due to the committee. It's there should there. be a link right on that as well. Oh, I'm happy yeah, to also couldn't send find you. it, but, um, but thank you. Yeah. But if you have it available, that would just be That's easier. Fine. There's so many links. It's there. I was just reading it the other day, so you'll find it. <laughs> I'm sure it's fascinating reading. <laughs> it is. It is very good. And uh, just uh, as an update now that uh, let's, that's a good segue actually. Thank you.